it. I want to greet you all in the name of the Lord. I welcome you all, brethren. Like I always say, there are a few verses that I would like to read before I got I get into what the Lord has prepared for us. You will become very familiar with especially these two verses. First is Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. When you come into the way, into the house of God, be prepared to hear. This is the word of God. Like I always say, five things that you must always take with you when you're going to church, especially the physical church. Your notebook, hymn book, your pen, your offering, and uh, your Bible. Five things. You will need those five things. So, like I always say, we have a mandate. God has given us a mandate. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18, it says, When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his, from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall, shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Praise Master Jesus. So, brethren, the message is too serious. When God has given us an obligation to come and minister, we don't come with enticing words of wisdom. To preach a certain gospel, I was hearing a, <coughs> a testimony where I don't know if there's a brother or sister who was taken to hell by an archangel Michael, I think. He was told 99% of the preachers that are preaching on planet Earth this way in are sons of Belial. You can just imagine. People are not rebuking sin. This, this was told, rebuke sin. Men You know, it's not from me. It also comes from, from something from another quarter. I only speak. So today we want to talk about. Pegatory. What is pegatory? We know those that are coming from the Catholic faith, the gospel of the vision. We want to look at that one and see what does the Bible mean? How does the Bible, how does the Bible interpret all of these things? Everything, it came, the moments came baptizing for the dead, they came with a doctrine. The Catholic, they come from, it is the same scripture that they use. When they heard Apostle Paul say, what will be this baptism of the dead? First Corinthians chapter 15. They came and also took that one to say, you can pray for souls that are in hell. So we want to explore together. First Peter chapter three, verse 18. First Peter chapter three, verse 18. We want to see, get the message right. We are not preaching against this, against that, but we are just telling the truth because there are people whose parents are still in the darkness. If this message is not preached, people are going to hell, people are going to perish, and we have got an obligation. I do not want any blood to be upon my hands, like I've read from Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18. It is not my wish that I come and pervert the truth to suit a particular audience. If somebody is offended because we are preaching the truth, to God be the glory. That is the mandate actually God has given us. 
because we have made our decision to go to heaven. We are not here to seek man. The angels are recording these messages and they will report to the Lord Jesus Christ. What is he preaching? We cannot claim CHMI is a ministry of God when we are not preaching his word. It means the devil has taken over. So we need to be very careful about our mandate. This mandate is not about friendship. The message is too serious. We are, look, we are living at a time where the glorious rapture of the church can happen. If we don't prepare the souls to enter. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 22. Praise the Lord. So our job is to prepare the souls to enter into the kingdom of God. And the truth, no matter how painful, must be told. We are not coming to condemn anybody, but it gives you the room, the opportunity to repent. Many went to sleep, they never woke up. Many longed to hear this message. They died without hearing this message. So it is important. It is when you go to the other side, Jesus tries to say, no, no, no. Um, and these people, if we were to look at it, you may think they're being judged too harshly. Why do we think so? Yes, there's no time in history where the Lord has opened heaven to all of us. We've heard thousands and thousands and thousands of testimonies. So if we are not hearing this way, what else are we going to do? When the Lord, if the Lord is to take any one of us to hell now, they've died, they're not coming back. If he ask you, say, if you say, Lord, can I have another chance? He will tell you, what chance do you need? I have given you over 40 years to live on planet Earth. You have heard these messages. It was preached on the, on the platform in which you were, you were attending. So if you cannot hear this gospel, there's nothing that is going to change you. Praise the Lord. Can somebody read for us, please? First Peter chapter 18, verse 22. I read in Jesus' name. Amen. First Peter chapter 3, 18. For Christ also had once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. We sometimes we are disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was then preparing. Praise the Lord. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Praise the Lord. Sorry. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I, I, I so, come again. Amen. So, are you proceeding? Sorry. Yes, sir. Okay, proceed. Sorry. Please, sometimes we are disobedient. Then, once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, we are in a few. That, that is, as souls we are saved by water. The life figure we are unto even baptism, that also now serve us, not putting away of the fields of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 22. Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers be made subject unto him. Amen. Amen. So Apostle Peter is talking about uh, this uh, anti-type and uh, it's type and anti-type, but I'll try to explain it in a way that we can all get it. The type of salvation that Noah and his family received by, received by water. The, the anti-type type of a salvation is the one by baptism that was made possible through the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. So, as we can hear, as we, as we have read from 1 Peter chapter 18, verse 18 to 22. The Lord suffered for us on the cruel cross to become a perfect sacrifice 
for our sins. When somebody sees what uh, see any video of what happened using your sanctified imagination to say what the Lord went through. If you are still living in sin, you must be very wicked. Very wicked. There are people who are living in sin say, God, help me to tie the flesh. There are some who have chosen to go, to go on a path of destruction. So the Lord Jesus Christ did this because he loved us. He loves us. He wants us to be reconciled to God. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 to 11. Let us read a few scriptures. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 to 11. We can read. We have as they can read. I'm there already, but somebody can read. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 to 11. I read in Jesus' name. But, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 to 11. But I read in Jesus' name. Amen. But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Amen. Oh, 8 to 11 is okay. Yeah, I wanted the 11 part of it. 8 to 11. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. 9, 10, 11. Amen. I read again in Jesus' name. Verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so. But we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Amen. Amen. So we can see when he was, um, he did it because he laughed that he was trying to reconcile us to God. Because we are all natural born sinners. So what happens because we are sinners, we are removed from God already. John chapter 15, verse 16, the one that we don't choose God he chose us because we are dead when you are in our, in our sinful nature we are dead we cannot choose it's not the dead that can choose the living so what happens is when the Lord chooses you to, it is the grace of God many are called but few are chosen not that we are called and men that we may not <clears throat> make it by the grace of God our hope is to get this message very right. It touches baptism. It touches a number of things. I want to show you something in the Bible. What caused this, um, the Catholic Church to teach this um, false doctrine of purgatory, which does not exist anywhere in the scriptures. It's the same thing. Like I said yesterday, you cannot come with a doctrine or using one scripture. It's pervasive, actually. It's immoral. They believe that purgatory is a temporary place of punishment in which a soul is tormented for a length of time, it will be five years, based on the sin. If it is made, I will go there for 25 years. So it was a practice which they started making money with until one pope stopped it in 15, uh, year 1537, somewhere thereabout. But they are still praying for the dead, all the same. They are still praying for the dead. But we have got scriptures that debunks that, that refutes that, that disputes there is no such thing as a purgatory. This is a lie from the pit of hell. 
once you die, brethren, I want to understand. I want us to understand. Many of us, either we are Anglican, Catholic, Methodist, uh, CACP, also those African churches. So we need to understand one thing. If this gospel is being preached, people are still living in ignorance. But ignorance is not a defense at law. That you have come to knowledge, Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18 applies to you. If you have got a parent who is still going to Catholic and this message is still being preached, it means they are now living, you have come to the knowledge of truth. You have got an obligation. By the action of the Holy Spirit, pray how to reach out to them because it's extremely important. So they say, if a soul dies, they go into a prison, let's say five years. If many people are praying, or if you give a lot of money, if I'm a millionaire, if I give three million to the church, maybe after two months, they will come out of hell to go to heaven. You can imagine the lies. They ignored all the other scriptures in the Bible. And that is done by people, suppose the theologians, people who have gone to school to, that's why the Lord Jesus Christ said, you know, another gospel. Apostle Paul said, let them be a case. If they preach another gospel, even if it's an angel, let them be a case. However, they claim that the, the priest can actually, in, during that time, because I think it's a practice, they talk. They will say a pastor can come in. They don't use the term pastor, the state priest. They will pray, intercede, you give them money. And then if it is your mother who is in hell, I don't know how they knew this soul was going to help. You can see perfection. Even we that are in holiness, no, none of us knows until we've entered. Mm -hmm. If I come and tell you, if I come and tell you today that I know I have got a place in heaven, it's a lie. Then no, I most likely be a candidate for hell. Nobody knows. So, like I said, in the Middle Ages, they made it into a money-making scheme. It's like this 419. They were making money. If you want, ah, my mother is in here, come. Yet, the Bible teaches us, during that time, there was nobody who died and came back from the, from the dead. Probably those that came back from the dead, the Lord never allowed them to tell their story. He just blocks their memory. Come back. Give them a small portion of the memory so that they start living in a way that you want. So this is one of the things that caused um, Martin Luther, the one who wrote that German book, to come out of the Catholic Church. We know that they still pray. We know they still pray, though they are no longer allowed to charge, to charge now. Hmm. But they still is still bad enough, whether they are still playing, whether they are not charging, is still a perversion. So, praying for the dead is not going to change anything. According to Hebrews chapter 10, chapter 9, sorry, chapter 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed upon a man who wants to die, but after this judgment, that means every other thing is a lie. Once a person dies, their fate is sealed. Once they close their last breath, the demons will quickly run with the steps, whether it's a, a pajero, say, take this one to hell. They, they will try to be nice because they know where you're going. That is the last time that you enjoy any kind of relief. Once you get there, day and night, there's nothing to talk about. So this is a lie. Some teach, I, I want to show us why, why this is, because we read this thing, he went down into the prison. Some teach that when Jesus was dead for three days, his spirit went into the spirit room. He preached the gospel to those who died in the flood. Again, this, you know, this interpretation doesn't make sense because they faith. these were people that know and say, come, 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 let us build the ark. It took about 110 years to build the ark, the ark of Noah. 
And these are the people who say, oh, my, my son is getting married today. Oh, my wife has got a baby that we're going out for lunch. This one said, no, I'm going to work. Every one of them is with excuses. The same excuses we are seeing today. That's why the Lord said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Many are saying, no, we cannot evangelize. People have grown wings. So me, no, no, let me have this small, small picky go and evangelize. You have become too big for it. You have grown a small horn now that God cannot use you. Brethren, God is not a respecter of persons. God is not a respecter of persons. Like we say, the people from, it is believed, the people from Noah's time, their faith, their faith was sealed according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. Once a person dies, but I will show us something, I will explain something so that we see where we are coming, where we are going. So it will be pointless for them to hear the gospel, the gospel which they rejected. It's like you tell, you tell somebody, don't put trousers and say, no, me. Trousers is fashion, there are trousers for a man, trousers for a woman. What is going to change? What preaching is going to change this person? Is it not the same heart? Like I said, there are some demons, they don't need a sacrifice. Once they get your wicked heart, they are done, they are at home. So we believe God does not show partiality. Because it will not make sense for Jesus to preach only for those souls in Noah's time. It will be, it is a thing that theologians, they debate here and there, but like always, we pray to the Holy Spirit to guide us on some of those things. Peter, when he was preaching to Cornelius, Cornelius' household, Acts chapter 10, verse 34, he said, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Partiality is when you take a side. You come to this one, you are taking a side with somebody. Let us remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 to 31. There are only two places that we go after we die. Either we go to paradise. I will explain this one. Paradise. Let me not go ahead of myself because I want to explain this one. It's very important so that we know. When either you go to hell or you go to what we wish, wish they used to call Abraham's also the place of torment, which Peter, Apostle Peter said, Tartus, Gehenna. Gehenna was a place in the Old Testament where they used to uh, throw rubbish. It was always burning all the time, burning, burning. So the fire could not be quenched because people would still come and be throwing their rubbish there. This is how they just hear Gehenna. There is no escape from, two of, from either of those places. Since there's a gulf between the two, Luke chapter um, 16, verse 26. Praise the Lord. So let us see. Like I said, the Lord descended to the source that were increasing. When people used to die, all the saints, when they died, they were being captured by the devil. So they were put in prison, not in torment. As they were put in prison, I'll show us why I believe that it is true. And the prison then was down. Hell and the paradise, they were like this. Like this. This one is on the left, this one on this side, and there was a huge gap between the two, a huge gulf that no man can come. They still can talk because they use it, I thought, to talk. So, when the Lord descended, ah, please let me, sorry, let me explain this one. The people that were dying then, because there was no sacrifice made, they were captured by the devil. So they will put them in prison. All those people, they were in prison. Until the Lord Jesus Christ 
until the Lord Jesus Christ went on the cross after the dead day when he rose. He said he rose with more, with several prominent dead people. These are the souls that were in, in prison. Some, they went straight to heaven. When the Lord Jesus Christ descended down, I want to show you where that hell was down, the, the paradise was down. It was not up. It was down. Let somebody follow me to 1 Samuel chapter 18, chapter 28. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 3 to 25. First Samuel chapter 28, verse 3 to 25. I want to do a little of explanation, then we'll make it interactive. It's good that when I hear your voices, it makes me happy. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hi, Rita. Yeah, sure, sure, please. Um, yes, sir. First Samuel chapter 28, verse 3. Can we mute, please? Can we mute our microphones first, please? Praise the Lord. Verse 3 to 25. Yeah. Okay, I read in Jesus' name. Now, Samuel was dead. And all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shonem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that had a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that had a familiar spirit in Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul had done, how he had cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, Praise the Lord. Do we see that? You will continue. He said, Bring him up, means he's coming from down. You can proceed. Okay. And when, verse 12, and when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw God ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stopped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, 
Why hast thou discreted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am so distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answered me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then doest thou ask of me? seeing the Lord is departed from thee and is become thy enemy. And the Lord had done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord had rent the kingdom out of thy hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore had the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow that thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell straightway all along on earth and was so afraid because of the word of Samuel, and there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day, nor all the night. Verse 21. And the woman came unto Saul, and saw that he was so troubled, and said unto him, Behold, thy handmaid had obeyed thy voice, and I have put my life in my hand, and have hearkened unto thy word, which thou speakest unto me. Now therefore I pray thee, hearken thou also unto the voice of thy handmaid, and let me set a morsel of bread before thee, and eat, that thou mayest have strength when thou goest on the, thy way. But he refused, and said, I will not eat. But his servants, together with the woman, compelled him, and he hearkened unto their voice. So she arose from the earth, so he arose from the earth and sat upon the bed. And the woman had a fat calf in the house, and she hasted and killed it, and took flour and kneaded it, and did bake unleavened bread thereof. And she brought it before Saul and before his servants, and they did eat. Then they rose up and went away that night. Amen. Amen. So we heard he was coming up from down, ascending. From down here, because then paradise was down. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came, that's when he, everything was taken up because the price has been paid. The, that's when um, <clears throat> uh, the death was um, conquered at the cross. So that means all the souls that were down, when the Lord went to the souls in prison, Adam, all this, they were all there. Say, Adam, do you know me? Say, no, I am the tree of life, the one that you were seeing. But ah, Abraham, do you know me? Say, no. When say, God shall provide the lamb, I am the lamb. Prophet Isaiah, when you said unto us a child is born, I was the person that was. So when all this, so, so when he went there, that's when he took all those souls that were being in, captive, in captivity because nothing was paid. Then it was when the Lord had his victory on the cross that all those souls were released to go up in paradise the paradise was taken from down, transferred up into, I don't know whether it's third heaven. Then we know the second heaven is one for the devil. So we go back, the assumption is in, it's up third heaven where our Lord Jesus Christ lives. So we need to find out when Jesus went up, when Jesus preached to these souls, 
Peter answered this question by telling us that the spirits were in prison, which refers to their location at the time. So Peter wrote this. Let us see what something that Peter wrote. Um, he wrote that they were preached to during the time of Noah. But in the time of Noah, it cannot quite be true because these are the people that rejected salvation. It's like this pervasive generation. If we reject the truth of God, we're going to perish. So once we reject the truth of God, it's done. There is no other preaching that we need. So uh, first Peter chapter 10, verse first Peter chapter 1, verse 10 to 11. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that will come to you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ was in them. So all these prophets of the old were prophesying using the spirit of Christ and the glories that would follow. First Peter chapter 1, verse 10 to 11. So we can notice here that the spirit of Christ is said to have been in these prophets of the old who were proclaiming God's word. So the, Peter also tells us, say, Noah was a very righteous man. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5. He was a preacher of righteousness, like we are preaching today. Noah did not manage to convince a soul. So if evangelism, if you don't win a soul, he ministered, everybody laughed, to say, oh, this man, this man. But as we know now, that he was saved only by his family. So we can see that Noah preached or Jesus preached through Noah to the wicked generation of his, day, of his day. For it is certain that our Lord, after the resurrection, did not, like he said, he, did, he didn't go personally to the Gentiles, the one that we're talking about separation, and to the Lord Jesus Christ. When he said he wanted to set Barnabas and Saul for a special ministry. So it is the Lord, that's how he reaches, by his apostles. But if Christ is said to go, if Christ is said Paul to go by, to go and do what he did by the apostles, so it means it is Christ who is doing the same thing. So it means he could have done, um, he could have preached during Noah's time using his spirit. So we can see a connection between the preaching of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, who in turn preached to, to the humans now. Because the, the, the Holy Spirit is our wonderful counselor. He is the one that is telling us the truth or leading us into all. He is the one who has sealed us for the day of redemption. If we are to be raptured, it's the Holy Spirit who puts a mark here. That's why the devil has also come up with this mark, the 666. Everything that he does, he also does the devil. Praise Master Jesus. So when the spirit of truth will come, guide us into all truth, he will not speak on his own authority. Like the Lord said, whatever he hears, so he will speak. He will tell you the things to come. You will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will take only what is of Jesus and give it to, declare it to us as human beings. That's in John chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. So as the inspired apostles spoke by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they were also, in essence, allowed Jesus Christ to preach through them. If I come to preach, this is what I was telling you. If you are truly called by God, you cannot come and use, abuse the pulpit. Then it's Jesus Christ speaking. Jesus Christ cannot come and be abusing people on the pulpit. Instead of me coming to preach the word, you will come and insult people. It cannot be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not have such kind of traits. So the Holy Spirit caused the prophets of the Old Testament and Noah to proclaim the word of God, which confirms how Jesus 
could preach through Noah to those people. It's like a connection. Let's just look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Praise the Lord. Can somebody read for us, please? Questions are coming soon, don't worry. I read in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Amen. Amen. So we can see the Spirit of God. They are talking about the Spirit of God. That this man is like flesh and the Spirit, they are always in constant fight. The longer we are used to, God gives us the grace to stay, we abuse the grace. Second Peter chapter 2, verse, sorry, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but by the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. So we can see which confirms anyway, same thing that we are talking about. So when Peter is talking about the spirits in prison, he's talking about where these wicked people were at the time of writing. But we, un we understand from a different, it, it may sound like a contradiction because once a person dies, judgment is set. It's like uh, you have committed a crime, you cannot be killed or your father is coming to pay the price so they can hold you hostage. Until that money is paid, then you can be released. But there's nothing you could do for them nothing you could do um, to this source anyway. So during the time of Noah, it was the time of 100 years, 110 years, divine long suffering until the ark was built. They say it took, of, it took Noah over um, 100 years, I know it's 110 years to build. But God patiently waited while the task was being carried out. So we can see that God in his infinite mercy at times, he gives us the grace. So only those eight souls were saved by water. Some may say that the ark saved them and not the water. It is true that the, um, the vessel that kept them from dying in the flood, but it was the water that saved them and transported them away from the sinful world. Because when the ark it was raised in water, so you can it's a question. It becomes a question of semantics between the egg, chicken, which start first or something. But principally, it remains the same. This is where you see the the analogy between the baptism of um, Noah's time and our time, the Great Commission. It is through the Great Commission now that the Lord is all the other five types of um, Bible um, baptism has been replaced. So while this uh, event deals with the physical salvation, Peter makes a comparison about how baptism saves us spiritually. So this way I was talking the anti-type, the type, the other one is it's like the type, the other one, the anti-type is salvation through water baptism. So type is a figure or a representative of something to come. On the anti-type was the real. It's like a foreshadow. So like uh, Hebrews chapter 10 teaches us, 10 chapter 1, that the law of Moses was a shadow or a representation of what we have under the new contract. Apostle Paul called, um, he called Adam the, a type of Christ, and he compared the difference between Adam and Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 to 49. Can somebody read it for us, please? 1 Corinthians chapter, 40, chapter 15, verse 45 to 49. Praise the Lord. I read in Jesus' name. 
And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As it is, as is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we also, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Amen. Amen. So baptism saves us. It's not symbolic of a person already being saved because this is the reality of salvation. It's no longer symbolic, like it was done in the ark. Now it is a reality for salvation. And we said for you to be for you to be saved, then you must repent. Baptism is only part. Of it. Like the type, the difference between the type. God offered salvation. He offered them salvation, the type of Noah. And he offers us present and continuous. No one has yet faith in God. We also have to have faith in God. No one had the choice to be saved or to be lost. This is, these are choices that we have. No one was told what he must do to, uh, to accept God's salvation, which was built in the ark. We are also told what to do, which is believing, confessing, and repenting. Repenting, repenting, repenting must be done repentant. Believing that he is. No man comes to the Lord until he know. So God was long suffering while he waited for the ark to be built. Same way God is waiting for us to obey scripture so that our Lord Jesus Christ can come very soon. All those who do not obey God's word are lost and they will perish. Like we said, there is no alternative to repentance. Likewise, you will all perish. So don't be lied to. We need to understand this thing. The element God uses us to save us from this sinful world is water. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, let us read. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. I want to show us something here. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. If you are there, say amen and read it for me, please. Amen. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few the be that find it. Praise the Lord. Narrow is the gate. We can see narrow is the way that leads it. It says, let me quote it exactly. But straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads it unto life. And few they be that find it. So Apostle Peter was obviously talking about baptism, water baptism. And the clear says is the water baptism that saves us. So there are some who believe that Holy Spirit baptism is necessary for salvation. We don't think so. It cannot be true. Because the Apostle Peter said, when you are telling them, you are not like washing this or your dirty. So it is not the water itself that saves. It is the place God has designated that will be saved by our faith in the working of God. Working of God. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. It is extremely important to get this. So when Peter said baptism was not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, it is clear that he was referring to water baptism. If you are not removing debt, do you remove debt spiritually? How do you do it physically? You cannot do it. 
So that explanation was actually to the Jews. Like I told you, they, before entering into the temple, that's what they used to do. They used to wash their hands or feet, just, just like the Muslim do. Wash their hands, feet, then they go into the temple as a sign that they do not want to embarrass themselves before the living God. So, baptism in water, Peter was talking about, was for the inward cleaning of the soul. Inward cleaning of the soul. The only way this is not possible is by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. Otherwise, there will be no hope for us. We will all be lost in our sins. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 to 19. We're not going to, we read it yesterday, actually. We still can read it. Say, now, if Christ has preached, has been raised from the dead, how do some amongst you say there's no resurrection from the dead? If they be so, where he talked about the baptism of the dead, which people were abusing, people have to find the doctrine. So when Peter said that baptism is, uh, is the answer or an appeal of a good conscience toward God, then it can be argued that baptism is a response to a good conscience, so we are saved before baptism. If that is true, then anyone who has got a good conscience will be saved. Yet we know that is not true because we have got honest Muslims, we have got honest Buddha, people with very good intentions, they live a very, very good life, actually, compared to most of us as Christians. So we need to understand this one, brethren. It is quite um, interesting when we look at the scriptures that anybody with a good conscience, people can talk at your funeral. Four or five hours, he was a good person, he was a good person. It is good that you live good with your neighbors. But if you don't live good with him, that you're going to meet them. All those praises will be for nothing. Even Apostle Paul had a good, good conscience when he was persecuting Christians. He had a very good conscience, actually. Very good conscience. He thought, he thought what he was doing was right. So many people have got, many people claim actually they have got a good conscience about their lives, no matter how sinful they may be. But does that, not, that does not make them saved. You cannot be saved on the basis of the argument. First Timothy chapter four, verse two. Now the spirit says that in the latter times, some will depart from faith. Yield to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with their hot iron. Deceiving spirits, familiar spirits. These are, these are the masters in giving prophecy, these spirits, the doctrines of the demons. Deceiving spirits, they can tell you all those things. The moment you see yourself being told the number plate of your car, your address where you live, or the number of people in your family, or the name of your mother, all those are useless things. You don't need them. The only way that we can have a good conscience that is pleasing to God is by having our sins removed, by living a faithful life before the Lord. That is what can, can make, make us good. Apostle Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, for our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we have conducted ourselves in the world in a simple and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God more abundantly towards you. Praise the Lord. So we can see here, let us read another one, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, 
from Mrs. TFA. So according to Apostle Peter, baptism is an appeal for good conscience because it is when we receive the um, forgiveness of our sins. <clears throat> Acts, chapter eight, Acts chapter 2 verse 38, when Apostle Paul baptized those men of God. So like we said, if baptism is an appeal for a good conscience to them, it means that the person who is being baptized must know what, is, what he is doing, which teaches against infant baptism. So if we are baptized as a child, it's a lie. These are the aspects we wanted to bring. If we are baptized as a child, how do you have a good conscience as a child? A baby cannot be baptized. A baby can be dedicated. These are all perversions. Praise Master Jesus. So one thing we need to keep in mind is that being baptized in Jesus is for the remission of the sins. Only is the beginning of our journey we call salvation. The challenge of remaining faithful until is like the, is to remain faithful until we die. If we do, our eternal salvation can be realized. Our eternal salvation can be realized. There's also this false doctrine of once saved, forever saved. It is also a lie because you see, once saved, forever saved. This doctrine allows people to allow somebody to get saved today, then return to their vomit the next day, laughing all the way, knowing that I can sin and nothing's going to happen to me. This is why if you see many churches, it is possible now to find somebody who's fornicating in the gate of the wire. And everybody knows it. One saved forever saved. God is not a wicked God. Uh -huh. Filush Pastor. So this teaching doesn't make any sense actually. It goes against the entire trust of the Bible. So when we examine the Bible, the Jews were God's people, but they had a problem with sin. Every time they turned their back on God, they were punished, which shows that God does not tolerate those who live in sin. Sin separates us from God, and that will cause us to be spiritually dead. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if one saved forever saved is true, then we can live in sin as much as we want and still go to heaven. So we need to debunk, to remove, to disprove this doctrine. Let us look at a few scriptures. Hebrews chapter 26, verse 10. 20, sorry, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and 27. For if we will, for if we sin, willfully, after we have received the knowledge of truth, they no longer remain a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful judgment and fiery indignation which will devour our adversaries. Hebrews chapter 6 verse, uh, 6 verse 4 For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and they have tested the heavenly gift and they have come partakers of the Holy Spirit. And they've tested the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again the Son of God for themselves and they put him to open shame. If people see me today, I'm preaching holiness. If they see me the next day, oh, drinking my beer and enjoying so oh was he not the man that God said he delivered him from these things so we need to know second John chapter 1 verse 9 whosoever whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God he who abides in the doctrine of Christ he has both the father and the son praise the Lord is it true 
Let us read the scriptures. I love reading the scriptures because it gives us an opportunity to know whether what we are learning is true. I don't, I don't want anybody to be just believing things. I want somebody to be learning. Second John chapter 1, verse 9. Whosoever trans transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ yet not God. He that abided in the doctrine of Christ yet both the Father and the Son. So that we don't say probably I misquoted the scripture. Another scripture, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in the in them, the affairs of the world. Once you are entangled with the your condition is a far much more worse than it was in the beginning. I like this verse so much. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. Therefore, let him who thinks is distant, let him take heed lest they fall. It is easy to fall, brethren. It is not how we start in ministry, it's how we finish. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to these things we have heard, lest we drift away. That's why I say pen and paper, your Bible, these things are very important. At times, you know, it takes us um, a bit of um, time reading the Bible, this, and when you come, some are touched, some are not. It is normal. Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. You have become estranged from Christ who attempted to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. So these verses, there are many, many more hundreds, hundreds of verses because of our time. We do not want to pick it up. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know those that uh, who run in race all run, but one only one receives the run, receives the prize? Run is such a way that you can obtain the prize. This journey is very individual, brethren. Jesus only promises the crown of life if we remain faithful until the end of our life. Gospel according to Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, fight the good good of faith, the good fight of faith, and lay hold of your eternal life. So, brethren, I'm going to ask a few questions now. If somebody comes to you, before the, and they say they want to repent, and they never get the chance to repent, what happens when they die? What happens if a person chooses to come to Christ, but you don't have an opportunity to say, ah, okay, we'll do it, or you'll get baptized after a month. Say, okay, every day we'll be having lessons, baptism lessons until they understand what happens if this person dies before are they left or not praise the lord praise the lord hallelujah yeah, let's go to the book of hebrew chapter 9 verse 27 You want me to read or you read for yourself? I read, sir. Okay, and, is, and is, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hallelujah. 
Amen. Hallelujah. That's the answer, sir. It is well. It's well. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, brethren, I said I wanted to ask you a few questions now. Let me not run ahead of ourselves. Why do we say we cannot baptize children? Why can a child not be baptized? Why can a child not be baptized? You take your four or five year old daughter, come, let us be baptized. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. A child cannot confess his or her own sins. Baptism is meant for um, a, someone that can be able to to confess Jesus and accept Jesus. So a child cannot do that. Baptism is meant for someone that knows the, for example, from age of 15, I guess, yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What is the difference between the child and the baby? Because now we have put an age, you say 15. I Sorry, I didn't know the question, sir. What's the difference? Between a child and a baby. She said until they come 15. What about these three, four-year-old that will put sugar like this, like they have put white beards? They say, mama is coming to make like this. What do we say to that one now? Already they know, they know what they're doing, so mm. they can distinguish between right or wrong. But what is the essence that I, I, want, I want us to, uh, to help people know why they should not just come and let my child be baptized. At times, parents are very emotional about these things, so that you go into scriptures and say no. You can answer any one of the questions. What is the difference between a baby and a child? The baby and the child is the same. Mm. The baby is <laughs> old and the 13-year-old boy is the same. Praise Master Jesus. Hallelujah. You have made, you have made up my day. Praise the Lord. Mm. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to know because it gives us answers. Please proceed. Uh, praise the Lord. I think... Um, the baby does not know sin. A baby is holy. A baby does not know the right and wrong. Just a baby. Does when, not... when, when we are saying baby, I, I want you. I want you to help me understand. I hear say. I hear you say. Your ten year old. Ah, my baby, my baby. What is? What are we talking? What are we talking? Can we give an age so that we don't? Okay, okay. from zero to three. Because I know from four words or some of the things, you know, the world has, the, the, this world has opened, eyes has opened, the devil has really working deep. So, at least from, I meant from zero or one day, to maybe two or three. Any child does not know what is sin. As you said, that one that will lick sugar, when you come ask, do like this and turn, do like this, you know, you know, that one uh, has no sin. Mm -hmm. But the baby just holy. A baby is holy. A baby is like, you know, from zero to two or three at most. So that so, one, yeah, praise the Lord. Uh, uh, whilst they're still there, if this baby that makes sugar like this, like a hot white beard, they make like this, they are knocked down or they get malaria and pneumonia, they die. Where do they go? <laughs> I want to help our parents to stop defending their children. Oh, go to hell. Mm -hmm. They're not insane. So what I think here, parents can help and still lead them to Jesus by praying to give themselves to Jesus Christ. Though they've not reached the age of baptism or what, we can still pray. Since how, sorry. How do we know that it's a sin? What this boy is doing is a sin. Of course, for so a child, it's a practical. You told me, you told, don't touch this. 
you know, and they see you. For them to hide, it knows they have committed sin, that they have conscience. Mm. Them. That, that is the answer I wanted. When you, once they hide, they know what they're doing. Yeah. They know they are not allowed to. I, I, we are just as, asking these questions to assist parents so that they know the children. Because, you know, there are some parents they will never let their children grow. Even 35 years, ah, this is my baby. It's my baby. A man with gray beard, like, this is okay, my baby. So that's why I say it's a baby. Find what is a baby. I know somebody wanted to come. It's, a, it's an open topic now. We can discuss. Apostle Maggette, you want to come in? Mchungaji. Mchungaji. Yes, I have, a, I have a question, sir. I was coming to you. I had called your name. I didn't know. <laughs> I just, I, I'm asking so that we can really understand more. Okay. Yeah. Since these children, when a child comes to the level where he knows right from wrong, it means they know, they have a conscience, they know what they are doing. So mm -hmm. why is it that these children cannot be allowed to confess Jesus, even at that little age, since they know? Because, because they will, if they die in that state, they are going to hell. Mm. So why, why is the baptism not permitted for them, given that they know what they are doing? It means if you tell them to, to confess Jesus Christ is Lord, they will know, and they, what they are doing is wrong, they can confess their sins. So why? Is it not allowed for them to do the baptism? I really want. To. I, 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 I really wanted you to get what I said. I said baby baptism. <laughs> but I, I brought in a child because many parents, no matter if in 10, 12, they will still say my baby. So I wanted us to distinguish. A seven-year-old can be baptized if they can speak with their mouth. Children of today are much more wiser than we were before. We, we, when we went to school before, they used to touch our, our our ear like this. If the head can touch another ear, then you go to school. Now they're just going on the computer and says, can you go to Google Place? Go to Google. So these are Google children. So I, I, wanted, I just wanted us to know the difference between the two, especially children. When you say child, for you, it's a matter. Your child may never grow. They will still remain the small baby. Even if they grow beards like this, it's just my baby. Mm -hmm. So you need to be very careful. If your child is six, seven, as long as they can talk, why not baptize them? There's no age limit in the Bible. Because if this, if this same child can distinguish this, ah, my mom is coming, do this. Then we know they've come to know what is right, what is wrong. So if they want to be baptized, it's not the age. There are four or five year olds that are more mature than most Christians who have been in faith for long. We had one of our daughters here who was preaching, who preached a very long message. She actually wanted to go for an hour. I said, Huh? That was impressive. Young child. If a young child can come and be preaching, we, mm -hmm. the what are we supposed to do? So there is no age limit for baptism. There is no age limit for going to hell. Whether we are, once you know, you could take your cigarette and be giving like that small baby, I don't know, Thailand or so, in Southeast Asia. The one that will be smoking, smoking. The parents are busy giving the, that child to smoke. You think the Lord will allow, and he said nothing filthy is going to enter into the kingdom of God. So if that small child will go, will die, they will, cost, they will perish. Believe me. Like it is written in Revelation chapter 20, verse 8, I saw the great, the small, the fat, the, the schlank, the tall, the short. All those things there is the rich, the poor. You know, especially hell is where everybody's equal. In heaven, there are different because of what you did. You cannot give your life to Jesus Christ and walk straight to be like Apostle Paul. No, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. It is not possible. So we need to understand certain things. In hell, that's where everybody's equal. 
whether I were a president, whether I were a lawfer, whether I were a shower, they don't really care. There you have got, it's only one place. One size fit all. That's where you come and fit all. If you say extra large, they will put like those clothes that are fitting now. Praise the Lord. So can somebody explain this thing to me? What is the difference between baby dedication and baby baptism? What is the difference between dedication and baptism? I want to dedicate my child unto the Lord. I want to baptize my child. We need to talk about these things so that we know the difference between them. If we explain them with scriptures, then it will be. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Okay, I think if you can help me, look, I think Luke chapter 2. Praise the Lord. Let us follow to Luke chapter 2. When we are learning like this, is good to check on the scriptures. We want to be like the Bereans. Check the scriptures. Let's see. If we do not find the answers, it's okay. We will still come back to the same topic. It doesn't really matter. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, where our Lord Jesus Christ was dedicated, dedication is good. As I said, baptism as child, he doesn't, the child doesn't know his left from the right. Education is good. A child is a gift from the Lord. It's good to dedicate. That is a perfect thing to do for a child. To dedicate that child to God, the, the creator, the maker. That's how our Lord Jesus Christ, he was, the parent did to him when he was born through Elder Simeon. So it's good to pray for that child and dedicate, declare good things for the baby. That is the gifts, the wonderful thing the child can get at that moment before all this we're saying comes in. So I think the dedication is good. I can't pick that particular verse in that. But I know our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was born, was brought to the church, to the house of the Lord, and he was dedicated unto God. So dedication is very good. And if we can, somebody can help us to get the particular verse. You know, but no, our Lord Jesus Christ, the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ, He is the one we are following. So I think it's good to do child education. Praise the Lord. Amen. I, 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 I want you to see the difference between child dedication and baptism. When you are dedicated unto child, we remember Hannah in the Bible. When she said, God, since you don't have prophets, all your prophets are failing you. Give me a child. Give me a son. If you give me a son, I'll give you a prophet. So God remembered her and gave her a son. And she said, God, now that I've got a son, you've got a prophet. And she gave that child back to God. So dedication, dedicating you're like just consecrating that child to God. Whereas uh, baptism, you do it as a personal confession, a confession. It must be by conviction to know that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he came, he went onto the cross. At resurrection, if you leave resurrection, there is no baptism. There is no repentance. There is no salvation. So baptism is always about the death, the birth, death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the difference. So on, on dedicating a child, you are just consecrating that child unto the Lord. If somebody has got a different uh, interpretation, please. Praise the Lord, sir. Hallelujah. Oh, Sister David, it's good to hear you. <laughs> It's not an interpretation, but there's something I want to talk about concerning this um, baptism. Baptism. Sir, so, so can you hear me, sir? Feel free. Feel free. We are here to learn. Yes. <laughs> it's concerning the baptism of um, of a child, um, because the Bible says that we should train up a child in the way it should go, so that when it grows, it will not depart from it. You know, children, um, this is my own 
<laughs> little this, you know. I just feel that children should not be baptized. Why? Because fine, they've gotten to the age of accountability where they know evil from good, but there are still certain things they don't understand. There are certain things that as an adult, an adult understand these things. Even in the Old Testament, there are times the, the law will say, okay, when a child is from 16 years, let them go for war. Let them, I mean, let them go. There's a, I've forgotten the place in the back where I was telling, at this particular age, they should do this. At this particular age, they should do this. But if you look at children, yes, they know that, oh, some of them will still, I remember those who were small, will just will hide secretly, you steal something, you don't want anybody to see you. But even at that, we didn't understand things. There are so many things we didn't understand. But it is even, okay, I gave my life to the Lord when I was 13. But there are certain things I didn't understand, even in the point that I was there. I, I didn't understand so many things. Until I, I now grew up, I now understand that, oh, this is how it's supposed to be, this is how it's supposed to be. So, this is my, this is just my own, this is that. I don't feel children should be baptized now, but it's good that we can train them. We can make them understand that if you do like this, you go, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. So they know. And because they have gotten the teaching, because they know if they now act in that wise, if the Lord comes, they will go to hell because they did not obey. They did not act according to the word of God. Well, this, I don't know. This is, <laughs> do we, uh, I want somebody else to answer. Do we, uh, do we ask this our children when we are praying with them to repent? Because in the God is not a respecter of men. If we say God is, the standard of heaven is the same. So if my, my six, seven year old child can fast with me, pray with me, do all these things with me, some of them, they even know Bible than most adults. So if this child, why, why can this child, <laughs> it's not an insult, but I've known Christians have been in church for 10 years. They don't know where Malachi is. When you say Genesis, they're looking in somewhere, Peter, they don't even know it's the first book in the Bible. That's why I say, hold your Bible, stop going on your phone. It will paralyze your mind. So, if this same child, we ask this same child to be praying with us, doing these things, they now understand. It's only right now we want, our, we want them to, they are going to school. But if they can get these teachings so that they understand, say, Mama, she will ask you, why can I not be baptized? Why do you ask to pray with me when you are praying? Why do you ask me to fast? If I cannot be baptized, what is the essence? Then I may as well be watching television, playing cartoons, watching cartoons and playing games like what other children are doing. Because if you, dis, if you deprive that same child that has consecrated their life, they don't know what is television. If the television they're hearing on a preaching, then I do not see, personally, I do not see, I don't put the edge to it. It's like maturity. Praise the Lord. No, I don't have to guard it myself. I'm alone in the room where I am. Praise the Lord. I do not have to catch it. So, brethren, there is no age limit. There are certain things, this is what brings on the doctrine. I say babies can be dedicated unto the Lord. It's consecration, you're setting apart. Say, God, may you be in this child's life. That's what we are doing. But as they start to grow, some wheels may come out because of bad association. It corrupt good manners. Depending on who they are playing with, they may change. These are the people that the Lord will still call back into the fold. So I want us to understand these things. It is not only when you say, um, my child is six, seven years old, I want her to be baptized when they are 10, when they are 15. Who told you they may reach that age? Why would you want to take it? 
personally, I don't see anything wrong because scripturally, there is nothing that forbids it. Nothing. Because if we're using the same standard of going to hell, why can we not use the same standard? Because this is the same, same boy that will take sugar and see you. So, ah, they know they've got sugar everywhere here. They know what they're doing is wrong. So, ah, mama is now coming, they make like this. If they can know those things, why not let them know? Teach them. If they understand what, what it means, say, God, because right now, these same children that you think are young are being taught homosexuality, sexual immorality in school. Like I always give you an example. My last one son was about eight, eight, nine years old or so. They were screening something on television. I had to scramble, say, where is the remote? They said, don't, don't, don't mind, don't mind the remote. I know everything. Say, so what do you know? They said, they taught us how to use the condom. So if we as Christians, we said the devil is gone ahead of them. The devil is only an operation catch them young. And you as Christians say, ah, let us operate shame, let them grow. <laughs> Brethren, we are mortgaging the future of our children to the devil. The devil is very precise. Once those filthy thoughts are transplanted, transplanted into their hearts, it's gone. So I want you to understand these things. The devil is only an operation catch them young. It is better you teach them the correct things now and at home. If they are baptized, remember that we are baptized, yes. They are no longer a baby. This, this same child you are calling a baby, they operate the phone better. They operate the television better. They operate the computer better than you do. So if you talk in terms of knowledge, now who is knowledgeable between the two of you? Maybe in terms of scriptures. So you cannot say somebody who does these things, they are not, they are not knowledgeable. So it's important, don't restrict them. If you explain to, to them certain things as a parent, and they will be explained again by somebody they will listen to it. That will say, once you, you don't go to sin, once you are baptized, don't stop lying, stop doing all these things as a mother. That's the role of a mother. Mothers often spend more time with the children than the fathers. So understand this one. Give them more education at home. They are being taught immorality, sexual immorality out there. Here it's a law. At the age of 14, they can sleep with any, any person. From eight, yeah, it's a, my son brought a book, it's a law. They brought a book like this, they say, look, I say not here, not in this house. It's a law that applies. Here they have got a supreme law of God. You cannot allow that nonsense. Yes, it's a law. It's, that is what they are doing. That's why homosexuality has been accepted. They have accepted these things. They are saying in school, they were, especially black people, they, they would want to insult you. So, so they will come and tell you, if I call you nigger, will you not be offended? So, ah, uh, me. So, whatever, you say, whatever you say, I will not be offended because it doesn't change who I am. So children, because people are more sensitive, they are being taught tolerance. So that when this operation catch on, when they come to 18, this is your daughter that you are protecting today. They would have slept with more than 20 men. What is the difference between this, our daughter, and Ashao? Are we not mortgaging the, the life of our daughter, the life of our sons? If they die, we claim to have, ah, I loved my son so much. No, you don't. I always differ. Spare the rod or spoil the child. There are two, two, two things, especially children in rights, children with rights. I saw a small picky one day. We want to drive from Innsbruck back to where we live. I said, ah, I, I just said, just manage yourself. I said, no, they said we must only sit three here. I said, this is not your father's car. I want to take you. I said, no. The child threatened the mother, say, I'm going to report you to my father. I said, <laughs> the mother was afraid because the mother is black. So what did they do? 
yet to go for a train where they will take two hours to get home because the children are for drive. Just imagine the kind, the kind of foolishness. The same child that you cook for is the child that is giving you rules now. This kind of love, they will bring your boyfriend home. Say, Mama, this is my new friend. Huh? And say, ah, good. You are a very wicked parent if you do that, if, if you do something like this. Especially those that are in Christianity. You know it's Europe now. There is no God for Europe. There is no God for Africa. Parents, I want you to be extra strict. Operation Catch Them Young is in full swing in schools. Girls are being taught how to use contraceptives. So that you cannot avoid. You're using all the song. Just imagine the age they are being taught these things. They are destroying the creation of the Lord. The Lord wants to continue to hedge more souls for his kingdom. So parents, I pray that you will be more firm. Stop giving that you, you call love. It's witchcraft. Because if that, if that child were to die in that state, all oh, the blood will be upon your hands. Let us read Luke chapter 2, verse 22. It says, And when the days of your purification according to the law of Moses was accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, the birth dedication. Usually the dedication this, um, in Israel, they do it after they first circumcise eight-year-old child. So this is the verse that she was looking at, dedication. So dedication, you're just consecrating that child unto the Lord so that you know the difference. But if you think your child is wiser, there are, there are people who have been moving from one ministry to the other. Now probably CHMI is the seventh church. Ha! This man, he's always talking about sin. There are many people who wanted to hear this message of sin that you are refusing to listen to. They went to sleep, they never came back. It's better you listen to this word. Sin must be rebuked. We cannot come and be pampering you like this. There's eternity at stake here. We have got an obligation to tell you the truth. If you reject to God, be the glory. Because love commanded is not love at all. Once I tell you the truth, I have washed my hands. God will tell you, I open you that. He said, it does not wish that any should perish, but come to him. Be wise and come back to him. If there are no questions, I'll give back to the moderator for contributions. If you have a contribution, something you just want to talk about from your personal experiences. So I was trying to show you, if you're baptized as a baby, it's wrong. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. You, you could have been dedicated, not baptized. Auntie Jovita, I give back to you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank the Lord for this hour. Okay, can you up the recording? The recordings. Can you pause the recording, sir? Sorry? Recording. Ah, sorry. Okay, okay. 